If you got your Bibles, you do. You got a very good thing. Amen. Let's go ahead and open up to Ephesians 5 and 2 Corinthians 11 is where I'll probably have us turn to tonight. Any other references of Scripture? If you want to turn there, you can. Uh, don't feel like you have to. Uh, obviously, as you can see, you have no notes. Uh, you have no PowerPoint. Tonight, I wanted to just do it the old-fashioned way, man, and just open up our Bibles and uh, um, take notes as you feel fit, um, and uh, we, can, uh, we can do that, okay? Uh, what we're going to kind of do tonight is just kind of wrap up our conversation that, you ha that we've been kind of doing over the course of the last uh, four weeks in talking about, um, you know, what is this thing called the church? And, you know, we, we, we've kind of looked at seven different uh, things that w really truthfully should be non-negotiable. Uh, seven marks of a biblical church, if you will. And we did that over the course of the last four weeks. And uh, I, I think that it's very, very, very critical that if we are going to function as a church, if we are going to function as members of the church, uh, those, those are non-negotiable things that must be uh, part of what the church is. Uh, obviously, we're not going to go back over through those tonight, uh, but I would highly recommend you go back and listen to those if you uh, missed any of them or didn't hear any of them at all, uh, because uh, what you will find is, is that it gives a very very biblically grounded, uh, solidified answer to what the church uh, is and how we are to conduct ourselves uh, in the church at an absolute, absolute minimum. Um, and when I say an absolute minimum, uh, bless you, uh, you know, the, the sad reality is, is that, um, you know, we, 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 if, we were, if we would admit to what's really going on in the church houses today, um, you know, we'd be lucky if, if, if we're doing one or two of those things, let alone all seven of them. Uh, but what I wanted to do tonight is just kind of do like a final, a final look at what this entity of the church is. And I want to look at it from the perspective of how God views the church. Okay? So obviously, if we're going to start to throw out ideas about the church... You know, we all, have a, we all have our own thoughts and ideas and preferences and beliefs about what the church is. And, okay, that's great. Uh, but the problem is when we approach it that way, then church becomes what we make it. What I want to do tonight is really take a look at it from God's perspective and let God tell us what the, what, how he makes the church and what signifies the church, if we could do it that way. So I have in Ephesians 5, um, obviously, like I said, this was going to be a major addendum that we were going to do on Sunday mornings, uh, but instead, uh, I've taken the time to do it here on Thursday nights. So, um, you know, I'll be referencing back to this addendum quite often in the future of our Sunday morning sermons. But the first thing we need to look at here is uh, obviously in chapter 5, is this, uh, this whole thing of the church is a bride. The church is a bride. And so I'm going to read verses 22 through 33. It says, uh, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord of the church." For we are members of his body, uh, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, 
but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now, Father, we come before you, Lord, and we ask you, Lord, that you would uh, help teach us uh, what it is uh, you'd want us to know about this entity of the church, the one that you died for and you gave your blood to purchase. Uh, may we give a, get a biblical perspective of this. May we understand, uh, or at least start to begin to understand, uh, how we should be viewing your church. And may we give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. So, what is the definition of a local church? If we were going to give it a biblical definition, what we would say is a church is a group of believers who gather together to worship the Father, study the Scripture, pray, and fellowship together. That would be a good biblical definition of what the church is. From time to time, they will observe the ordinances of either baptism uh, or the Lord's Supper, and they are sent out to make disciples, all under the authority of the head of the church, which is Jesus Christ, and under the authority of the biblically qualified leader leaders. That is the definition of a church. Okay, that would be a biblical, we could, we could throw all kinds of biblical verses to back up that statement. And, and as simple as this definition may sound, uh, you know, the, the, the question has to be asked, is this what's happening in today's churches? And uh, I don't, again, I don't mean to say that from, a, from, a, from the perspective of being arrogant. Uh, I'm just asking the question, uh, is, that's what, is, that, is that what's happening? The church uh, is thought of uh, today, uh, and, and truthfully, biblically, it's thought of un under two different uh, entities, if you will. Uh, we call one of those entities, what we're doing right now, the local church. The local church being a physical representation of the church body where we meet together as an assembly, okay? Then there's also the, what we call the universal church, okay? Um, and so as we conform to the image of Christ, you become a unique entity within the body. It's important to understand the differences between the local body of Christ and the universal body and the importance of how, how each function together biblically. And let me just stress, you cannot have one without the other. They work together in unity. An organism must be birthed, hence the born-again stuff, while an organization starts somewhere. This church, this local church, started somewhere. Started out of the Thorson's house in 2013 of August, right? Both are correct. Unfortunately today, there's a lot of folks that do not believe that the local church is something that we need to do, that we need to be a part of, or we need to be members of, and that we can just be a part of the universal church and we're good. What I want to prove to you tonight is that is incorrect. And I want to show you how God views the, ver the, the, the church, excuse me, not the verb. Um, I'm sure he views verbs well, but that's not what I was going for. I'm not even sure why I said that. That made no sense. All right. The uniqueness of the local church. All right. Jesus Christ died for the church. Ephesians 5, 25, Acts 20, verse 28. He died for the church and he purchased the church with his own blood. Okay. Listen. He did that for both the local church and the universal church. He gets glory in the church. He gets that both in the local church and the universal church. Angelic beings take notice of God's wisdom through the church. You could find that if you wanted to, to, to thumb uh, in Ephesians 3.10 uh, where it says, to the intent that now under the principalities and powers and heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Only a church 
only a church has to have biblically qualified leaders. Uh, 1 Timothy 3, Titus uh, 1. Now listen, you can't have a pastor without a local church. I mean, just stop and consider that for a second. A pastor leads a local church. That's what they lead. You say, well, no, they can do it out of the house. I think you could do church out of a house. I'm okay with that. We started out of a house. However, if you're going to do it out of a house, I would suggest you better make sure you have an ordained biblical pastor leading it, and then you better make sure you also have the administration to run it. I would be willing to bet that most house churches do not have that. Okay? And that's just the truth. That's just the truth. And so if you don't have that, then my question is, how are you taking care of the ordinances? Okay? How are you functioning? At, who's leading your, your group? Who has uh, 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 been given the God-given right, because it is a God-given right, uh, a God-given uh, uh, call, Jeremiah 3.15, of pastors, okay? All those things are not negotiable. They are absolutely necessary to the function of the church. And you say, well, I don't agree with that. Well, don't argue with me, argue with God, because that's the one you need to talk to about that. That is the way he set it up. Only a church is given the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Only a church is called the body of Christ. Colossians 1.18 The New Testament clearly identifies local congregations when it uses the word church. The church that is at Laodicea. Is he talking about a local entity or is he talking about the universal entity at Laodicea? It is most definitely a local entity. There are two different ways you can use the word church in the Greek. And knowing the differences between the two is a difference of understanding whether we are meeting at a local assembly or whether we are talking about the universal church. So the uniqueness of the universal church. Uh, there's also uses of the word church referring to the entire collection of the body of born-again believers from the resurrection to the rapture. Now, what I want you to know is that this represents the minority of the applications of the use of the word in the New Testament. I mean, if we're going to study this thing out, let's be biblical. Let's not just drop our thoughts or ideas about it. Let's let the Bible tell the truth. The universal church, as many refer to it, is not actually a church by definition. Because here's the thing. The word actually means a called out assembly. And the universal church will not be called out until the rapture of the church. Now, I hope you really think about what I just said right there. Because I guarantee you, anybody who thinks they don't need to be a part of a church or go to church, yeah, they never thought of that. And they don't know biblically enough to know how to get to where I, what I just told you. Because it is true. The word actually means a called out assembly. When does the universal church get called out? At the rapture. So technically speaking, there is no called out assembly until the rapture. Hey, if we're going to be biblical, let's be biblical about this. In the meantime, the last 2,000 years of church history, God has ordained that his work be done in and through local assemblies. And if you want to argue that, then I would say you really are not understanding your Bible all very well. You really are missing a lot of the points that are being made, and you are missing the fact that a lot of things that the Bible is calling the local church to do can only be done through a local setting. You could not do it from a spiritual setting. You can't love one another spiritually. You can't, uh, 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 the, the 41 and others cannot be done spiritually sitting at your couch at home on a Sunday. You, you follow what I'm saying? You have to be a part of a local setting to do those things. Did Jesus tell his disciples, hey, 
this is what we're going to do, okay? You guys are all part of my little discipleship head here, this little gang we got going on. But y'all can just stay home and just via, via, via you know, we'll, we'll just talk via text. Is that how that went down? No. They met with him. They gathered with him. They were with him. All those things cannot be done unless we are together. So I want to point this out and I want you to understand the importance of, hey, don't worry about pastor last Thursday going, the left side of the room's empty. Okay? Uh, don't, don't worry about that. You're not, a, you're not, you know, you're not having to answer to me <laughs> at the end of the day. I, I'm just encouraging you all to do what you should do. Okay? Because at the end of the day, the, 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 you got to answer to the big guy here. Okay? And I promise you that he takes this church thing very seriously. He's died for it. He purchased it with his own blood. And so when the Bible says, do not forsake the assembly, hey, do what you want with that, but I can promise you this, there is going to be accountability for it. You know, and, 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 and like I said last week, and, and again, I wasn't trying to call anybody out. That is not what I was intending to do. But, but what I am trying to say as the pastor, hey, listen, man, okay, there is going to be a great accountability to this. There is. God did not mean for this to be something that we just sit home and watch on YouTube. That is not the way God designed this. And although I get it, I, although I understand that sometimes we get sick, sometimes things happen, I get it, and every, every now and then you might have to do that. And I'm glad that we have the avenue to allow you to do that. But I just want to stress to you, don't let that be a crutch. That you, you, you I don't feel good, I'm just going to stay home tonight. I, I wouldn't do that all that often. Because do remember, God knows your heart. He knows. Yeah. Did you go to work today, though? When you didn't come tonight? Did you do that? You see what I'm saying? Be very careful. And again, don't worry about me. <laughs> I'm just trying to encourage you to do the right thing. And don't get mad at me for encouraging you to do the right thing. To, 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 just, to remind you, hey, <laughs> really, really take this church thing seriously because God does. He does. He takes it very seriously. Six metaphors of the church. Here's some further expressions of the uniqueness of the local church. I already mentioned one of them. It's called the Bride of Christ. The Bride of Christ is a, uh, uh, a special way to show forth how unique we are. We're His Bride, right? We're His Bride. And, and listen, a, a woman, you know, and, and hear me, okay? Don't, don't, don't read into what I'm saying right now. I'm trying to give you... Usually, the woman is the one who goes gaga for the man. Quote, unquote, worships the man. You see what I'm saying? And I'm not saying worship in the ass, but do you understand? There's a reason why God uses these metaphors. Because he's the one that made us. And he knows where our desires are and he knows how we will act. But on the flip side, the man is supposed to love the church like Christ did. You know, we look at that and we always look at that, that, that idea of how the woman is supposed to be sum, in submission to the husband. Well, number one, we better make sure we understand what the word submission means in the Bible. That's number one. And number two, we also better make sure we understand what it actually says as unto the Lord. You only submit to your husband if he's submitting unto the Lord. If he's not submitting unto the Lord, then your priority is to the Lord first. Because at the end of the day, guess what? You aren't going to give an account to your husband. Or are you? You just better make sure you understand which husband you're going to give an account to. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Y'all follow what I'm saying right there? Okay. 
Um, so one thing we're called is the bride of Christ. It's, it's, this, it's this understanding of what worship is. Is your husband worth it? Worship, you know, worth it. Is, is your wife, do you love her like Christ does? There's a uniqueness to this thing called the bride of Christ. It's also called the body of Christ. Now, what you need to understand within the confines of the body of Christ is this was where fellowship happens. And it cannot happen unless you're part of the body. A body. I'm a part of the universal body. Where did you get that in the Bible? Show me that in the Bible. At the rapture, you will be part of the universal body. I agree with that. I agree. When, when the called out assembly is called out at the rapture, I'm with you 100%. But has it been called out yet? Huh? So where are we getting that? Well, if it did, we're all, we, we're all left behind. We got some problems. Where did you get that from? See, I'll tell you where we get that from is because it allows us to sit home and do whatever we want to do and not worry about the consequences of what's really going to happen. But at the end of the day, whether we believe in something or we don't, the Bible's the final authority, and if there's going to be an accountability to something, there's going to be an accountability whether we want it or not. And there's going to be an accountability. There's going to be. Number three, it's called the family of God. Hence the reason why we get adopted into this family. Now again, this looks at our relationship part of it, piece of it, where we perform those one another's with each other. And truthfully, even in part of that fellowship. Uh, uh, we're unified together. We're working to accomplish the same goals. Uh, we're, 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 the, we're, we're in a relationship with God. We're in a relationship with others. Uh, we are called children of God, right? So all these things. But, but what I want to tell you is, is that the body of Christ and the family of God, although there is going to be a universal application to that, and listen, I get we could go to Ephesians 2, 6 right now and say, well, wait a minute, Pastor, I, told you, I thought you already said we're already there. Hey, listen, man, I, I can't explain all that. I don't know how that all works. I'm just telling you that in the here and now, in this flesh, the local body is a very important entity. This is where church gets done. Now, yes, we take church and we be the church to people. But to say, I don't need to go to a local church, we are the church, you don't understand what being the church really means if you make that statement. You don't really understand it. Number four, it's called the flock of God. Now, this is where I would say this absolutely, 100% requires the local church. Because what is a pastor? A shepherd over what? Okay? Cannot do that without a pastor. Now, this is what I hear people say. Well, Jesus is the chief shepherd. That's all I need. Okay. Who's checking you? Who's checking you? Where, where's your accountability? Well, Jesus is checking me. Are you sure? Are you sure? Because I'm telling you, in my experience, just my experience, do what you want. The folks that do not think they need to go to church and they can stay home and be the church and all that stuff, they are doctrinally incorrect about a lot of things. A lot of things. Why? Well, because if you're not being held in check, you can just believe whatever you want and just go with it. And you have nobody, nobody to tell you, hey, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa look at this. Look at this. Look at that. Nobody's holding you in check? Number five, the Bible actually calls it the building of God. I mean, what the heck? <laughs> I mean, the words are actually used. This, this is where discipleship takes place. We are a holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, a holy, 
whole, the whole, the whole of us all, temple, that is holy, H-O-L-Y, and growing in the Lord, what? Together. You cannot do these things outside of a building, if you will. And I don't care if it's in a house, and I don't care if it's got four walls. God never said you can't have four walls. God never said that. Somebody's going to have to show me in the Bible where it says that because I don't see it. The last thing I, time I checked, the tabernacle had four walls, if you will. The temple had four walls, did it not? The synagogues that Jesus went into, did they have four walls? Did he ever say, you can't, this is wrong, can't do this? No. Where does he ever say that's wrong? Now, here's what I hear people say, right? Oh, they didn't start the whole church thing till 300 AD with, with Constantine. You are incorrect. That is a fallacy. That is not true. Now, I will agree that when uh, uh, Constantine merged with uh, Christianity, he took the basic and made it glorious in the Roman Empire's eyes. I'll agree with that. But what I will not agree with and what is incorrect information is that there weren't churches that had location outside of homes. Biblically speaking, what they did is they met house to house during the week. And let me argue, let me let me just say this, just so you get just so you grab onto this. And I think we could argue this, and I think we could give this down pretty biblically. And if we were to look back in history and use secular history and Christian history to they would meet house to out house Monday through Saturday. Every day. Every day. And then they would assemble as a whole church body on Sunday. We just meet once a week. <laughs> we can't get what we should get. Our whole church body should be here. I'm just being honest, man. That's just me being honest. Do what you got to do. I'm not going to argue with anybody, but our whole church body should be here on Thursday night, and our whole church body should be here on Sunday. And it should be a priority. And we all know that whatever you make a priority in your life is what you'll do. You know that, and I do. We all do. If it becomes a priority to be here on Thursday night, you will work your schedule to make sure you are here. If it's a priority to be here on Sunday, you will work your schedule to be here. Let me ask you a question. Is it a priority to you that you're up, you go up in the rapture? You want to make sure you're on that board, right? Well, then what? what, what? <laughs> That's a called out assembly. What do you think when we get called out is going to happen? We all want to be on board with that one. Well, well, how come you can't be on board with it on Thursday and Sunday too? As the called out assembly, if you will, comes together and gathers, gathers right now to do what we're going to be doing when we get up there. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Finally, it is called the vineyard of God. The vineyard. And, and obviously, when we're talking about a vineyard, what we're talking about here is a stewardship. We've been given stewardship over something. We have been entrusted with something. And, of course, those, the, 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 when I say something, really what I should be saying is some things. Because we've been given an awful lot of resources that we've been entrusted with. And we are going to be held accountable to them. You don't need to go much further than 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1 and 2 uh, to, 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 to understand the truth of that. I could go a lot further than that, but, uh, the, you know, uh, definitely that would be a good start. All right, so what is this thing of the bride of Christ? So, you know, we've talked about this. Uh, uh, oftentimes you hear me talking about the importance of understanding similitudes, pictures, right? Uh, God is a great, great teacher through pictures. Obviously, when he's talking about this bride of Christ thing in, the, in this Ephesians 5 passage, he uses the picture of a husband and a wife. So the marriage relationship is a picture of Christ and his church and depicts its unique relationship that we are a part of. It's important to understand that as a Christian, you enter into a covenant relationship with a local church, just like you enter into a covenant relationship 
with your husband or your bride on the day you said I do. Now let me ask you a question. And I'm being for real. When you entered into your covenant relationship with your bride, did you enter into it, husbands, or your husband, um, brides to their husbands, you know what I'm saying? Did you enter into that, relate, that marriage covenant relationship physically or spiritually? What? Both. Both. Right? There is a spiritual application to that as you became one, right? But is there a physical application to that? All the husbands should say amen right now. Because there is. Do you see why I say you can't have one without the other? You can't play one side of the field. Right? You get both. They're, both of them are important. I'm not trying to be funny, but how many husbands in here would say, well, you know, my wife and I, man, we don't do any physical stuff here now. That, that wasn't why we got married. We're, 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 it's all spiritual. Y'all, okay, uh, Husbands, y'all okay with that? I ain't trying to be funny. I'm asking a question. So do you think... David, David chirped up real quick on that one, okay? Listen, but listen, man, listen. Why do you think it's any different? Why would you think it's any different? Let me just say, this is the most unbelievable part about it. It's by design. So then within the setting of the local church, what does not work in real life in a marriage will also not work in the marriage we have with Christ. So how many times have you heard me use that example? How many, would you, how many wives would, be say, would say, hey, it's okay, husband, I got you, man. As long as you hang out with me on Sunday from 1030 to 12, and then the rest of the week you can go do whatever you want, man. You can go hang out with other girls. You can do whatever you want. But as long as you hang out with me on Sunday from 1030 to 12, we're good. How many wives would say, yeah, that's a very successful marriage? Would you be okay with that? Of course not. Yet, that's exactly how many treat Christ. Many treat him that way. They think they can just go hang out with him for an hour and a half on Sunday, and we're good, man. I did my worship for a half an hour, not even understanding what real worship is. Listening to the message for an hour, and, and God forbid the pastor went over five minutes. Something's not right. We're not viewing this in the proper perspective. No, no. We need to be the church all the time. Not just in a local setting. It's important to understand that in these last days, we have a very consumer mentality. And let me just say, it is not acceptable, nor is it biblical. By any means. It's one of the greatest mysteries that we are to be the stewards uh, uh, and fellow heirs as Gentiles to the promise. And we're going to talk about that in Genesis chapter 3. This is a great mystery. Uh, As in 1 Corinthians 15, when it talks about the first Adam and the second Adam, you know, Christ is the second Adam. The first Adam, if you remember... He was put to sleep, and a rib was taken from him to make his bride so that he would have a helpmeet found that would be appropriate uh, in helping him accomplish his mission. Uh, I, I would argue that most people don't really even understand what a biblical marriage really is supposed to look like. I learned that from Mark Trotter. And any of you ever gone to the marriage conferences, you learned it too. And boy, does it blow your mind when you start to find out what a biblical marriage is actually supposed to look like. But do note, this is the same thing that happened with our second Adam. God chose us, the church, to be the ones to help carry out the mission with him. They were called Adam. We are called Christians. They are one flesh. We are one flesh. No one anticipated the Messiah in the Old Testament would be married to a Gentile bride even though the pictures of Christ teach this truth. It was hidden from the Old Testament saints' understanding. And yet, Adam had a Gentile bride. Isaac had a Gentile bride. 
Joseph had a Gentile bride. Moses had a Gentile bride. Boaz had a Gentile bride. I mean, I'm just trying to show you pictures. I'm just trying to show you, but yet not were they just pictures. There was, there was physical, actual happenings there. Like Isaac and uh, Rebecca are real people. <laughs> Joseph uh, and Azanath, uh, Egyptian, his Egyptian bride, they're real people. Moses and Zipporah, his Ethiopian bride, they're real people. And then, of course, Boaz and Ruth. See, we are in Christ. Ephesians 1.1. Ephesians, remember, in Christ, right? But yet, but yet, it's not just that we are in Christ. It's Christ in you. Colossians 1.27. Both aspects happen. So let me get, so get this. Are we in Christ spiritually or physically? No, you're going to have to think about that for a minute, aren't you? Huh? Is Christ in us spiritually or physically? See, what do we have to get rid of? See, there's a fleshly thing about that. There's a physical thing about that. And Christ is, is, is he's pumping his blood through us, what, physically or spiritually? What I'm trying to show you is the local church and the universal church, yes and yes, both are applicable, both are important. You need to be and must want to be part of both because if you get rid of one, you can't have one without the other and perform properly and correctly as you should. It is the reality of it. It just is. And God is showing us time and time again this biblical truth. We become one in Him in its exclusive relationship with Him that we should be careful about adding anything else that is not pure to it. Husbands, do you want your wives running around with other guys while you're not around? Wives, do you want your husbands running around while you're not around? You want that thing to maintain its purity, don't you? Well, what do you think Christ wants? I mean, just, wh why is it okay for you, but not okay for him? Huh? Let me just throw this out there. Do know, you don't even have marriage if it isn't for him. That was a gift that he gave us. The fact that we can have a physical relationship with our loved one is a gift. It's not just something you deserve. You didn't just, you didn't earn it. See, but what happens is, because, and especially where we are today, we take all that stuff for granted. Hence the, hence the reason why there is so much sex outside of marriage. We just don't care anymore. It don't matter anymore. Because, you know, it's for my self-gratification. I could care less. Most people could care less what the institute of the church is and what the bride of Christ is and how, how serious God takes this marriage thing. Listen, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible about marriage. And the reason why is because there's something to all of this. And we need to start getting on board with what God, remember how I started this? We're going to look at this and view this the way God views it. Note this, right? What happened, ladies, when you married your husband? Did you keep your last name or did you take on a new name? Huh? I mean, you're supposed to take on your husband's name. Sometimes that doesn't happen, but that's the way it's supposed to go down. So what happened the day you took on your Christian husband. Did you get a new name? Listen, you got your new name two times over. You are now called a Christian, but you also have a new name. I don't know what it is yet, neither do you, but you got one. Hey, do you see how often 
God is, is, is bringing these entities together? <clears throat> what does a marriage look like? When a man makes decision to sacrifice himself for his woman, he dies to himself for her because he loves her. And the lady will leave all that she has and come and live with him as she lives for the man, helping him living this, live this thing called life. This is what a biblical marriage is supposed to look like, yet our culture does not understand this. And what I would say is, here's, the, here's probably the saddest part of it at all. Christ did his part. How are we doing? We have been called to be obedient to him. We exalt him by submitting to him. Ephesians 5, 22 to 24. All of our ways and needs, all of our thoughts, all of our opinions, whatever it is we want to throw into that bowl should all be filtered through him and him alone. We exalt him by living holy lives, uh, by sanctifying ourselves from the world and from self for him as we uh, allow the word to wash and clean us uh, as we get ready for our wedding day, always preparing for it, i.e. that's what Proverbs 31 is really all about. It's not about the best life now. It's about eternity with him on that day when we will then will have our best life with him. Amen? Yes. 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4. Let me read that for you real quick. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me? For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through suddenly, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if he receive another spirit whom you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. And let me just ask you a question. Why, when we read those verses, can we say, man, Paul had such a love for that Corinthians church. Wow. I mean, he just wanted to present them as a chaste version. He really was trying to warn them of all the problems. And then when Pastor Frank calls out other churches for what they're doing wrong, we got a problem with it. I'm only doing what Paul did. I'm only doing what Paul did. Just as Paul had no problem making sure because he wanted to present it a chaste version, he knew that there were other Jesuses, he knew that there were other spirits, he knew that there were other gospels being preached, he knew there was false things going on, and he was willing and able to call those out. Why would we look at Paul and say, amen, brother, and then look at Pastor Frank and go, what are you doing, bro? You can't do that in the church. That's just not right. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Hold on a second. Do you think that there were problems back then in the church? I mean, we're, here we are 2,000 years later. Do you think it got better or worse? I mean, because if you think it got better, I would sincerely ask you to go turn to 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, and just read what it says. And you'll find out real fast that, no, it hasn't gotten better. It's got worse. Listen, there are three stages of weddings in the New Testament times. And truthfully, even in Old Testament times, if you really want to take this thing back to the Jews, it's a very interesting thing to study. But just on its basic terms, there was the engagement. That would be the espousal. Oftentimes in Old Testament times, it was arranged. As the bride prepared for coming, the coming of the wedding, it was a time of purification for herself. A dowry was paid and a binding agreement is made. Because it puts a guarantee on the wedding. We are espoused to one husband to be a chaste version for him. He imputed righteousness unto us. This is our undergarment. I mean, if I was taking notes right now, I'd really be taking them right now. 
He imputed righteousness unto us. This is our undergarment. What we are in the process of preparing is our outer garment. Man, I just dropped some serious biblical truth on you right there. I hope y'all were listening. Because what I fear is, many today, if they truly are Christians, they only care about the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the undergarment. They could care less, or maybe they just don't even know about the outer garment. But I promise you that outer garment is going to be important on the day of your wedding. I promise you it is. How would you feel, husbands, if your bride presented herself with no gown, did not do her hair, did not do her makeup, and walked down that aisle with raggedy clothes on that day? Would you feel honored as a husband? See, how we live on this day definitely matters on that day. It really does. Of course, then there's the wedding. The bridegroom comes and escorts the bride back to the home he prepared for her. Oftentimes, if not all times in the Old Testament and in, in, in those early New Testament times, it was unannounced. Hello, rapture. Have you ever been around a bride when it's getting close to her wedding day? <laughs> you know, all the time of preparation that went into it, when it starts to become a reality... Now, when things don't go right, brides, on the wedding day, are you upset? Huh? How do you think Christ is going to feel about these things? I'm just wondering. Then, of course, we know there is a wedding feast. Biblically, that would last for seven days. I'm sure that's coincidental. While the wedding party all celebrated, you know, because there's a seven-year tribulation, you know, in the Bible, Proverbs 31.10, Solomon, the, uh, the man who had it all, the man who had, although he should not have, but he did have 700 wives and 300 concubines. You know what's interesting is he makes a very interesting statement over there in Proverbs 31.10. He has a thousand women, and this guy says, who can, buy a virtu- who can find a virtuous woman? And then he says, for her price is far above rubies. Now, the last time I checked, what color is a ruby? Huh? So why are we, what are we called to? What is the first step when we become Christians? What are we called to? In our spiritual growth. What's our, in our spiritual growth, what are we called to first? Add to our faith. So who can find a virtuous woman? Who can find a virtuous woman? And what is virtue? Man, in the simplest forms, doing what you know is the right thing to do. Is tithing the right thing to do? Is coming to church the right thing to do? I mean, let's just keep it simple for a minute. Is reading your Bible the right thing to do? Is being a part of discipleship the right thing to do? I mean, listen, let's just keep it simple. There, there's clear verses that we can go in the Bible and say, yeah, yeah, no, we could definitely do it. God loves a cheerful giver. What do you want to do about that? Call it whatever you want. Call it giving, call it tithing. I don't care what you call it. But he definitely loves a cheerful giver. Should you give? Yes, you should. Don't forsake the assembly. Should you forsake the assembly? No, you should not. Uh, if you love me, keep my commandments. How will you know them? They're my disciples indeed. How? Because they love me. Okay, so clear as day, no questions asked. Just some simple stuff right there. Hey, virtue, practice it. Practice it. Because who can find a virtuous woman? Solomon, who is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, could only find one. Well, actually, I don't even know that he could find one. Only one is found in the Bible. (laughs) And that one was a lady by the name of Ruth, who was a Gentile bride, by the way. 
And it says, and now my daughter, Ruth 3.11, fear not, I will do thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of thy people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. And man, if we had the time to go through the book of Ruth right now, oh boy, huh, you want to talk about a picture book. You want to talk about what we're talking about right now and putting it all in biblical terms. Let's just go to Ruth for a minute, and this is where I'm pulling all my stuff from, okay? But do you know what Proverbs 12, 4 says? A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. Now, all, my, all, all the folks that... Uh, uh, have been around long enough to know about the five crowns and, and, and how we're going to be casting those crowns before the throne should know exactly what that means. But, but, but watch this. But she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. Do you want to make your husband ashamed? I'm not saying you're not saved. I'll let, I'll let the Lord deal with you on that because that's his deal. What I am saying is, though, you tie that with 1 Corinthians 3, and it says that you're going to suffer loss. I have a feeling that has something to do with being rottenness to his bones. I have a feeling that has something to do with walking down that aisle with no wedding gifts and no wedding gown. Yeah, your, outer gar your inner garment got prepared, but your outer garment never got prepared. Because he takes care of the inner, you take care of the outer. And, of course, we exalt him by bearing fruit. Now, I, again, I'm not trying to be funny. I suppose in these days it's changed a little, but I can promise you going back in, 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 in time, you know, a woman who could not provide the husband a child would be considered broken, would be considered, you know, Rotten. I mean, literally, go back and look. That was a very, very important thing back in the day. And these days, I, I, don't, I don't know. People, I don't know what's going on with the world today. But, but back in the day, that was considered very important. Well, what do you think, what do you think Christ is thinking? You know, he, he espoused you to him. We're supposed to be bearing spiritual fruit. If we're not bearing spiritual fruit, I would say we're rottenness to his bones. It makes sense. See how it all ties? See how it all makes sense? We've been called to avoid adultery. Adultery. Um, what is adultery? You know, it's... I guess if we were going to go biblically, uh, I would say it's impure. It's something that's impure. It's, it's a mixture of adding something to something that is pure, that wasn't supposed to be there. So if a husband commits adultery against his wife, it's because he has added something to that relationship that should not have been in that relationship, i.e. the other woman, or the other way around, however you want to look at that. Okay, that's how we look at adultery. But adultery, biblically, goes beyond that. We can commit spiritual adultery, okay? Uh, Jesus says that if you look upon another man with lust in your heart, you have committed adultery in your heart. Lust within your heart. Yeah, I mean, he's, look, he's looking at it from a whole different perspective. Hey, if you just look upon a guy with lust, you've committed adultery. You, wait a minute, I didn't even do anything. And God says, well, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, but you did. But you did. You were thinking about it. And that's bad enough. Because God knows that when you think about it, you think about it long enough, you'll do it. You'll do it. So how do we look at this generally? Really, the truth is we should avoid going down to Egypt. You know, what are you talking about? Uh, well, Egypt is a picture of the world in the Bible. Avoid friendship with the world. Who is the God of this world? See, when you mess around with the things of this world, you are committing adultery. And here's the worst part about it, whether you ever thought of this or not, who are you committing it with? Come on, somebody. Satan. 
See, I bet you never thought of it that way. However, do you know, that's the way God sees it. And by the way, it is enmity with God. John tells us. If a wife looks outside of her relationship to have her needs met, would you consider that disrespect? Well, why would we not think that the same is true biblically? <laughs> because it is. How does this look specifically? Jesus Christ is the bridegroom, so the church submits to his authority. Colossians 1.18. He ordains leaders in each local church. Uh, Acts 14.23, Acts 20.28, 20, to name quite a few. Then the local church pastors that he has uh, 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 ordained will then give an account for him for how they lead. Uh, Hebrews 13, 7 and 17. Wrong authority without the local church. You know, things like parish churches, government, people, education systems, etc. There's a reason why we should never mi mix church and state. It's wrong. Uh, I, would, I, I would say, at its core, parachurches are wrong. Do you know what a parachurch is? It's a church organization that's functioning as a church, but they're not a church. Yet they're doing the things of the church. Now, I will say that, unfortunately, in these last days, what we've done is because the church is failing to do what it's done, that's the reason why we have parachurches. If the church would have done what it was supposed to do, we would have never have, had, had gone that route. But... Regardless, I think they're wrong. Wrong authority within the local church. Well, I would say messed up qualifications for pastors. You know, just because they graduated with a degree does not make them a pastor. Just because they went to a seminary does not make them a pastor. Those are, those are not biblical qualifications. I would say messed up raising people uh, within the church with biblical truth. Uh, I would say that if we're just being completely honest, most people, whether they go to church or they don't go to church, are biblically poor. They're they're ignorant. And I see it time and time and time and time again. And you want to know how I know it's absolutely true? Do you know how many people I've been in Bible studies with? Do you know how many people that have come through these doors? Do you know how many people I've been around where I start talking about stuff about the Bible? Like, I never learned that before. I never heard that before. Well, I, well, well let me tell you why I never heard that before. Because when I say 95% of churches don't teach this stuff, I'm not saying it out of pride. I'm saying it out of truth. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. Most of you will have to admit. And I'm not saying that this church is better than any other church. I'm just telling you. Just admit it. Some of you might, not, might be able to say, yeah, I did learn this stuff somewhere else. And, and you know what? I'm not going to say that's bad. I'm going to say, praise the Lord. Amen. I'm glad. Thankful. Yeah. We need that. Okay, but the reality is, it's true. Why is it that you didn't learn this stuff somewhere else? Because somewhere else isn't teaching it, let's be honest. Somewhere else is not preparing you for what's coming. But you cannot plead ignorance on that day. And that's just the reality of it. Get mad at me all you want for telling the truth. Finally, what we see a lot in local churches today is denominational leadership. You know, most churches today, or, or a lot of churches today, are denominational-led, they're deacon-led, or they're the prominent members of the church-led. And that's just the truth. You can argue with me, you can get mad at me, you can go, oh, uh, uh, why, how could you say that? Because uh, it's true. Uh, 3 John 1, go there real quick. 3 John 1.
Look what the Apostle John says here. Of course, there's only 3 John 1. So if you're in chapter 2 of 3 John, you have an incorrect Bible. You need to get rid of that and get a new one. All right, 3 John, verse 9. John says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doth, prating against us in malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. So, what's the, the last thing that brings us to wrong authority within the local church? People who love their own preeminence always will bring about wrong authority and will always cause division and disunity. Always. Whenever their opinions, whenever their ideas, whenever what they want preeminates the church, what will follow all the time, every single time, is division, disunity, uh, start naming it. And it's true. And of course, we were warned this would happen in the last days. It has happened, and we need to know that. You know, as you look through the Bible, we see that every church struggled with uh, division. The Corinthian church were divided in the fact they were suing one another. The Galatian saints were bitter and devouring one another. Uh, to the Ephesians, Paul wrote about the importance of keeping the unity. In Philippi, two women were battling it out in the church. Paul called the Laodiceans to be knit together in love because they were uh, battling it out. The Colossians were commanded to stop quarreling and to forgive one another. Jesus uh, uh, specifically prayed for unity. So unity in the church uh, is a, a, a paramount thing that God is looking for. Not only unified with one another, but unified with him. I.e. enter in 1 Corinthians 1.10. Hence the reason why we use that as a very important verse around here. And so then finally, what, what are we unified for? What, why is it that we are to be in unity? Why is it that we've been called to unite? Not just attend, but unite. Well, it's because we all have different spiritual gifts. We all have different operations, administrations. And it's all to be used for the unification to profit with all which edifies, not divide, is what carnal Christianity does. We don't create peace. Do you understand that? We don't create peace. We don't create the church. And so on and so on and so on. We just endeavor to keep it. Christ is the one that creates it. We just endeavor to keep the peace. We don't create the church. We endeavor to be the church. Do you see what I'm saying? What has happened in the local church today is we manufacture our own peace. We manufacture our own church. We manufacture our own ways of calling the pastor. We manufacture our own ministries. We manufacture our own uh, things that we do within the church. We don't create those things. We just keep what he gave us in the Bible. That's all we do. Does that make sense? We, we are united for functionality. Uh, uh, you know, 1 Corinthians 12 would be a great place to go here now, okay, if we had the time to go in there. Uh, I would say Romans 12 confirms that the local church is compromised of many members, and the different members have different offices. Those members need to be connected to each other and exercise their unique gifts. This can only be done in a local setting. Now, if God has called for a local setting, I want you to hear me. If God has called for a local setting, and if God has made the uh, very, very obvious point 
that the local setting is the function, which is to be married with him. Yeah? Everybody with me on this? Okay. If that's true, then let me ask you this. Then wouldn't it just make a whole lot of sense? Wouldn't it just make a whole lot of sense? And I could prove this biblically, but I'm not going to right at the moment. I'll just leave it out there for you because the obviousness of it should be apparent that you are a member of it. <laughs> do you think, honestly, do you think God made this thing of the church as something that we should just be able to go wherever we feel like, whatever we want, whatever, you know, hop in, hop out, do whatever we want? Do you think that's how God did this? Does, wouldn't that fly in the face of marriage? Makes no sense. Like, show me the example that would signify that that's okay. That's why I tell you, if we're going to allow things to be uh, biblically proper, then what we have to understand is, is that there are only, really truthfully, a few things that God gives biblical reasons to leave a church. Now, I'm not saying that the time may not come where someone may have to leave a church. But what I am saying is just make sure your reasons are biblical. Okay? So let's just stop and consider what would be the biblical reasons why God would allow a husband to divorce his wife or a wife to divorce his husband. Because that's your answer. And to try to come up with anything else, you made it all about you now. You think you're smarter than God. No. The biblical answer is, what is God's prescribed reasons why it's okay to leave a marriage? Well, obviously the first thing that we could come to is death. Right? Right? I got a verse in the Bible that tell, talks all about it, right? If, the, uh, if there's a death of your husband or wife, then God gives you a biblical reason why you can marry another. Okay, so how do we take that and look at that in the church? Well, it would have to be a dead church. It would have to be a dead church. Now, you need to know the difference from what a church who has the candlestick in it looks like and what a church that is actually dead looks like to understand that, okay? But if the time ever comes that you believe this church is a dead church, well, then yay, man. Do what you got to do. Just make sure that it actually was a dead church and it wasn't you that was dead. You understand what I'm saying? Abandonment. Abandonment. So if the husband done abandon his wife, or if the wife done abandon his husband, God gives you a biblical way to remarry. Okay. So if this church, or the church you may be going to, if you're listening online, whatever, abandons you, well then yeah, you have the right to go to a different church. You have that right. You've been given a biblical reason to do so. And then the last one should be easy. Right? Adultery. Adultery. And that is, if this church ever dabbles and fornicates with false doctrine, then you have every right to get out. If this church is not growing you in the way that you need to be grown biblically, and you have every right to get out. Or any church for that matter. Those are your biblical reasons for leaving a church. Now, <laughs> my wife, man, you know, she just doesn't do this, this, or this. And all she does is this. And man, I don't like that she wears blue on Friday. And I can't believe she likes that music. Ah, divorce. 
My wife, man, she's just always nagging on me on something. She's always telling me about something. She's always calling me out for something. Ah, divorce. Are those biblical reasons for a divorce? Show me in the Bible. Go ahead. I love Jesus. I love God. I'm a follower of God. Well, then why aren't you listening to what he says and why aren't you abiding by his rules? You would, you, you know in your heart of, now in today's season, this is what happens. In today's society, that is okay. That is the reasons to get divorced. Heck, if the wife ain't making you happy, then dang it, you can just walk away anytime you want because the men's, men's only divorce lawyers are sitting on every I-95 I go down. Do what you got to do, man. Hey, the wife's there to make you happy. Really? Really? No. No, I'm sorry. And I promise you every single man and every single woman who divorced their husband or wife for unbiblical reasons, there's going to be a price to pay. There is. It's just a matter of fact. Okay? But, but if there was death, if there was abandonment, or if there was adultery, then you have a biblical reason for doing what you did. And so I would say, hey, man, you know, if you've ever gone through a divorce and that's what happened, then, uh, you know, have a little peace of mind, unless you were the one that did it. But let me tell you something. Take those same principles and apply them to the church. And don't think you shouldn't. Because you should. Because if you shouldn't, tear Ephesians 5 out of your Bible and pretend like it's not there. Because that's the only way you could get to that place. We treat the church today like a buffet. We just go to whatever. And, and you know what, man? It's probably the way many people go into marriages. Let's just be honest, man. Look how pretty she is. Look at the, you know, we can start naming all the stuff. I ain't going to start naming them. Right? But then once, you know, the woman gets pregnant, maybe adds a few pounds, whatever. Oh, you know, I don't know about that anymore. You know, there's, there's got to be something better over here. Really? See, see how selfish we are? See how selfish we are? And we can do that in, the, in, in a, a, a physical uh, uh, relationship with our, with our husbands and wives. We do the same thing in the church. That church doesn't have this. That church doesn't have that. That pastor's always nagging. That church, that pastor's always calling stuff out. That, pa that pastor's always doing this. That church is always doing that. That church does this. That church does that. What? Blah, 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 blah. Okay, good. I'm glad. I'm glad you got your opinions about all those things. Let me just ask you, did the church commit adultery? Did the church abandon you? Is the church dead? Shut your mouth. Do what you got to do. Why don't you start learning how to be the proper member of the church instead of worrying about what everybody else is doing wrong? That's the problem we have today. We're so good at pointing what everybody else is doing wrong. Everybody else is doing wrong. He's doing, you're doing wrong. You're, and we're never, never, never looking in the mirror to see what we're doing wrong. Hey, you know what? Maybe the reason why the church is failing you is because you're failing the church. Did you ever think about that for five seconds? What I wanted to give you tonight was a biblical perspective of the church. I hope I did. I hope you got a good understanding, at least a better understanding of it. That's all biblical. Now, there's no way I could have gone to all the verses. But if you've been around this church at all, you know that everything I was just telling you, there's verses to back it all up. If you need verses to back it all up, please, by all means, Come to me, and I will make sure that I get them for you. Amen? All right. Whoever wants to go watch the Jaguars lose, you can now go do so right after I pray. Father, we come before you, Lord. We just want to thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you do for us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you loved us enough to die for this church. Lord God, help us. Help us to be the church you would want us to be. Help us to not make this about us. Help us to be... Uh, uh, the stewards that you've called us to, do, to, to be, 
Help us to understand our role, uh, not only as your wife, but also as stewards. Uh, Lord, we have a great responsibility, but you have given us so much, and we need to understand that that responsibility is not something we earned. It's not something we deserved. It's a privilege. And Lord, if we could just understand in our own marriages that it's a privilege, uh, maybe we would treat our spouses a little different. Lord, we do love you. We do thank you. Uh, we do ask that you bless this church, continue to watch over us and guide us. And, and Lord, if, if this church ever is headed down the wrong direction, uh, I, I pray, Lord, that you would um, make that known and that we would get back to where we need to be. Lord, we do love you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all the church said, amen. amen. Love you all. Have a good night.